Hello everyone out there at Uncensored Radio Land, all the UCR people. We are coming at you today with a very special live, 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 live uh, transmission. We have with us, I guess, I guess um, by by some kind of random crazy default, the woman of the hour, Miss Katrina A. Johnson. Now, we are, she has asked me to preface this for everyone. Katrina has not been struck down by the Illuminati or anything like that. She is alive and well. She is recovering from, uh, you've got, what have you got? Pneumonia. Pneumonia. And then I said, yes. a great idea to get on an airplane. I didn't know I had pneumonia at the time. I got on an airplane and that made it worse. So it took it from my, to my head to everywhere. It's just, you know, a just little sharing uh, the wealth. <laughs> yeah, it's unattractive. So if I cough, be forewarned. It's okay. I'm on the mend. <laughs> and we have longtime friend of the show, Katrina's very best buddy, Daisy, here today. She's going to um, be throwing in her research, her, her wonderful research skills. Uh, because what we are talking about, I think the whole world is slowly coming to have um, gotten through it. I sat there and did the whole four episodes last night here in Australia. Where, wow. Oh, this, is a, this, is, this is a dark ride, kids. This is a dark ride. So we are talking about Quiet On Set, the dark side of kids' TV which is a four-part documentary which has just aired on ID. Uh, basically, oh, wow, um, telling the history of, so, well, some of, let's let's be 100% clear and, you know, um, journalistic about it, some of the history, some of the sordid history of what, ha what has happened. That's a good uh, way to do it. Of the sordid history, yeah. And this is exactly why I said to Katrina, I was like, okay, I've watched it. How do you feel about it? Because for the people that don't know, um, this has been a long time coming, this documentary, hasn't it, Kat? You've been, you did this a long time ago. Yes. Uh, I want to say a year ago. Is yeah. It maybe around there. Um, and they were reaching out to you before that. They're, yeah. Oh, yeah, they were they've reaching been out to you before that. A very long time, and I ignored it for, I don't know, six months, eight months, a very long time. It wasn't until other people that I knew um, had been approached by it and were doing, um, you know, interviews and things. So once other people that I knew were talking to them and were interested in it, I gave it a little more credibility and I said, okay, well, you know, I trust you and you and you, so I guess I can do it. Then when I started talking to the producers, they were asking me a lot of questions, particularly about Dan Schneider. And I said, well, I have nothing bad to say about Dan Schneider. He was my mentor. He was good to me. I loved him. Part of me will always love him. Like, you know, some of those moments that, were on that show with Dan Schneider were some of the best times of my life. I will never forget them in the best possible way. So I said, I pulled out of the project. I said, I don't want to be part of anything that is negative about Dan Schneider or really about Nickelodeon because I had a great experience. You know, I wouldn't change it. There were some things, you know, that were disappointing, but I don't think that's anything crazy. I think that's par for the course. I think that's Hollywood. But I think that I don't want to be part of a witch hunt. You know, I don't want to ridicule him. He never did anything bad to me. He was great. And they said, this is not a witch hunt of Dan Schneider. This is not a negative show. It is a documentary and we're just telling the truth. You should come on and tell your truth. And then they said, we are not saying that he abused anyone because there's no legal documentation of that. So you're safe. Also, we have your stage manager from when you were a kid, Virgil Fabian, coming in. And I said, oh, Okay, great. If Virgil's doing it, I can trust that. I trust him. 
and I can trust this program. I said, okay, I will do it if you put me in with Virgil and I get to see him for myself. I know he's there. I know it's true. Then, then I'll do it. Okay, so that is where we began. Now, for those of you that have not seen this yet or um, understand the depths of what this is about, we're going to quickly play the trailer for you to give you an idea of what Kat has um, kind of experienced. In the early 90s, Nickelodeon was kid everything. And you better hope that your house had cable wasn't there to educate you. We were there to have fun, to get slimed, to be entertained. And this is when Dan Schneider arrives. Nickelodeon's golden boy. He created these shows that were hugely successful for them. No one had ever really done sketch comedy starring kids for kids. He launched the careers of child actors who became major stars. For 20 years, he shaped children's entertainment and culture. Hey, thank you for being here. But that marked one of the darkest chapters. Working for Dan was like being in an abusive relationship. Dan's treatment of people on his shows was an open secret. So my lawyer filed complaints, gender discrimination, hostile work environment, harassment, and it was so devastating. How safe can any kids be in that environment? there would be even bigger problems down the line with actual pedophiles on set. These are three predators who worked at Nickelodeon all in a short amount of time. Oh my gosh, what are you for you? It was a toxic environment. It made me trust people less. We were there for so many hours. You get comfortable with people until you're not. I had no idea what I was saving my son from. It's a house of horrors. They find this enormous trove of child pornography. The officer said we found Ziploc bags, each one with a girl's name on it. 11 charges of child sexual abuse related to a child actor. It made me wonder who was being hurt. I've been waiting 17 years for today. It wasn't dealing with anybody on the shows or anything, right? It was a child actor. On one of our shows? Yes. Have you ever told your story publicly before? So, yeah. So that is what was advertised. Also, um, they didn't tell me who else was in it. They didn't tell me what it was about. And they didn't tell me what it was even called until it was released. They only told me it was called Quiet On Set. And I'm like, oh, well, that's cute. I'm like, wait a minute. It could also be very ominous because it's quiet about what happens on set. But I took it to me quiet on set. Oh, that was part of my stage manager on the show. Kevin used to always say, quiet on set, five minutes. So I was like, oh, that's cute. Until it wasn't. To Katrina, never. I can't imagine that you'd ever need to quiet you down. Right. Right? (laughs) Right. All right. So today is all about kind of um, setting your record a little bit straight. Having watched the... I just got goosebumps at the end of that trailer, having watched the whole thing, and just went, "Oh, okay, cool. I know so much now." <laughs> like I'm just like, "Oh, there's so much information." But our conversation behind the scenes was, "Let's set the record straight for you because you've you had people contacting you directly, going, "Oh my yes. God, are you okay? What happened to you? Did something yes. happen to you?" Da, 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 da. So <laughs> let's let's start at the very very beginning. How old this is, and for your fans, they will know this information. You started with Nickelodeon at how old? 10. 10 years old. And yes. as you say in the documentary, I think they used you really, really well in this first episode Thank to you. kind of lay the groundwork of what it was like. Mm-hmm. Because obviously there was a big shift from the late, the late 90s 
yes. to the 2000s to the yes. mid 2000s the whole machine changed when, when things got bigger but as you said your parents were, were always on set with you always around so oh, and i was lucky enough to have two parents so if one wasn't there the other one was always there they could take turns if one if they were both tired or you know one was tired so i was fortunate because i had a lot of supervision and at the pilot yeah. my parents and my grandma came so i had lots there <laughs> And you've you've said when we talked about we talked about this um, really kind of briefly before the show came out when the trailer dropped that you know the whole stardom thing the whole being on TV was never your parents' dream it was your dream oh. and they just went okay let's go yes. <laughs> if she's gonna go we're gonna go with her well I had to prove it to them I had to work for it before they would let me they didn't just let me I had to like really jump through some hoops for them I had to find some local performances that I could perform in. I had to keep up great grades in school. I had to really apply myself and I had to prove to them that nothing else was going to suffer if I was to choose this career path. I that's what I was going yeah, to, that's what I was going to ask you. Do you think that that is one of the major differences? Obviously what and knowing knowing what we know about child stardom from yes. everyone not only this documentary but you know movie stars from here to the beginning of time i think it's if all your parents it. want to be famous if your parents want you to be famous to be famous to make exactly. money then they'll put you in some situations that are a bit Ugh. right yeah. yes i agree um yes <laughs> I was very fortunate. I mean, I had great parents. They were always there. They were supportive, but they sheltered me from anything bad. I never saw, I never saw anything bad, really. Um, you know, they talk about how young people in Hollywood grow up or way too soon. Okay. Yeah. I had a job at seven. I'm, I'm grown up too soon. I get it. But I was never exposed to like, drugs or alcohol or crazy parties. I was invited to some really good ones, but my parents were always there. I never saw anything I wasn't supposed to see. Um, and it was like that on and off set. I think where a lot of the bad, bad things that happened were when parents weren't close enough with their supervision. Or they were, you know, gotten around. But that that obviously happened a lot later in the process yes. than when you were when than when you were there. As you said, um, Dan kind of took you under his you were his first little protege, basically. You were you were the you know to to have a child, you know, you say in the in the show, they were you they were taking you to the laugh factory to support you to build up your career to basically um set you to stardom now this is something i know that you hadn't really mentioned a lot in public well, i don't think you've mentioned in public a lot either until the documentary you obviously mentioned to us that after the success of all that your parents got a phone call saying <laughs> well we got two good phone calls which one are you referring to are you i'm saying your i'm saying your own television show okay your yeah. own television yeah, show the network did call my parents and say we want to know if you'd be interested in um, moving forward with the Katrina Johnson show. And I said, heck yes, that'd be amazing. Yes, please sign me up. What, where do I go? What do I do? Yes, I'm in. Okay. And how, how long into the process of all that was that pitch to you guys? Was that like, uh, straight away or a couple of years in? Or? Season two, so pretty fresh. When you know, they see say what you can do, though. End of season two, um, no, after season two, in between season two and season three. Okay, and so even that early on, no, nope, I've he lied. had the I've idea. <laughs> nope, nope, that's not true. Nope, it was before the hiatus because we were already working on scenes during season two. It was season two. So that's what that's that was my that was my next question. You you've got all that, and you know, obviously, 
there and it happens with all of the cast. There were the there would be standout performers that people get a little bit more attention, mm-hmm. as everyone alluded to. Like you were close or you weren't close, and that depended yeah. on your screen time. And they were taking you to like the laugh factory and stuff like. They were treating you like an adult, and we were talking about with your parents. They you treat this was your job. It wasn't the be all and end all of your life this was a working career that you were you know hoping to and my parents were very much hoping that i wouldn't stay in forever they did not (laughs) treat it like this was my lifelong career they treated it like we will support you until you grow out of this and you're going to go to college and you're going to have a backup plan and you're going to have all these life skills that you're going to need later on down the line and i think that's the difference between my parents and like you know, a backstage mom who's, you know, pushing the kid for their own desire. And just to... Curdy. Just to, um, (laughs) just to put it 100% clearly, you Mm -hmm. worked personally with Dan very closely. Yes. And just to spell it out for the people at home, your relationship was professional. Of course, a hundred percent. He never touched me. It was never inappropriate. Dan was my mentor. We worked together. We created scenes together. Sometimes we were on screen together and that's it. He was very professional. I learned more than I could ever imagine from him. And I had the time of my life doing it. There was nothing inappropriate. There was nothing wrong. There was nothing bad. I have only amazing, beautiful, fond memories of that time. Awesome. I think that's really important for people to understand with the, the heft of the second, like, yes. or yes. not even the, the, the three quarters of this documentary is really, really heavy. And I think it's important for them to understand that late night, like 90s Nickelodeon to new millennium Nickelodeon to like post new millennium Nickelodeon are very, three very different situations because of the people that were in power and worked there. Yes. So, and I yeah. got a lot of DMs where people are like, oh, my God, are you okay? And thank you. Thank you, everybody, for reaching out. Thank you for your love and support. But I'm okay. I had a pleasant experience. I did try to say that on camera. It just didn't make it in. But I'm okay. I, I was blessed and fortunate. And I had a couple of, you know, disappointments, but I don't think it was Dan's fault by any means. It was the network. Yeah. And I had a great time. So let's let's segue into disappointment a little bit. Um, the documentary, I don't know, they probably saw gold and we're like, okay, golden child of, of the original cast. And then along comes a 10-year-old that, um, yeah, as you're getting older, mm-hmm. talk, talk to us a little bit more about, you know, well, the way that the documentary frames it, you told them to pick Amanda, right? Okay, <laughs> yes. Let's, let's clear it up. <laughs> okay, what happened was um, I was performing at the Laugh Factory doing stand-up comedy. And it was a special showcase they would do every summer for kids. So it was all kids. And I had Dan and Brian from the show come and see my performance. And I said, well, and by the way, look at her. She's really talented. You should see what she can do. Now, I didn't mean to replace me. (laughs) (laughs) You never do, do you? uh, That's what happened. So she was hired onto the show. I was getting a little older. And at first everyone was like, oh, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. You're not the same. But we were the same because I started out as the baby and then they hired a new baby. I mean, she was my same type. We looked alike. We played sisters quite often. The difference is the younger, cuter, fancier, new version got more time that and is the way and that's the way i don't think that was you know 
life ending. I think that's just Hollywood. I think that's what happens. I think they hired me as a baby. They wanted a baby. And by this time, five years had already passed. So at the end of season three, I've already been in this game for five years. It took a long time from the time that I was hired for them to hire all the other people and then get to do the pilot in Florida, put together the crew, all of that. Then it took another year after that before the first season ever started. So by now, I'm five years older than when they hired me. I mean, it makes sense that they need a newer, younger version. I get it. It's okay. And uh, in that, you would have seen in that time people come and go because it's an ensemble cast show. Sometimes people click together. Sometimes people don't. They start out promising that it doesn't end up. I'm sure there are people that, you know, were cast that never made it to air, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But you never expect, I mean, you, well, you can because, you know, it's the industry. You, you you have famously mentioned um, a couple of times the phone call to your house about um, your changing physique <laughs> and um, how that was received. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, this is hilarious. Um, the network at some point called my house. Um, I want to say right after season two and said that I was too fat. Um because I was, I was pudgy. I was going through puberty. There was nothing I could do about it. At the time, I was a dancer. I was in dance class six hours a day. So I am working out six hours a day. There is nothing more I could do about it. And that's what my parents said. They're like, well, I mean, it's puberty. What are you going to do? There's nothing more she can do. She's dancing six hours a day. So they said, well, you got to figure it out. She can't be the fat one. We already have a fat one and she can't be the fat one. And, you know, I was kind of like shocked and that stuck with me. And you know, to this day, I still hear that in my head, like the, the devil on my shoulder saying, oh, no, 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 no. You can't be the fat one. Careful. Better do something about that. You can't be the fat one. And I will say that... You know, I luckily had a very healthy self-esteem. It didn't really bring me down. Um, so I'm okay. But I could see how someone else could develop an eating disorder or who knows what for that. I didn't. I was happy. I was lucky. But then it backfired because I come back for season three and I've gone through puberty and I'm got this dancer's body so i am thin and curvy and no pudgy no baby fat i don't look 10 years old and it's exactly what they asked me for do something about it you can't be the fat one okay great i come back guess what i'm a size zero i'm not fat guess what they hated it <laughs> they would duct tape down my boobs they would do all this crazy stuff so I mean, that part was made me feel, you know, I'm damned if I do, damned if I don't. That's a bummer. But again, that, I don't think that's anyone's fault necessarily. It's just life. It's just puberty. What are you going to do? It's the reason why, chill, like, child, it's the reason why, you know, when you have, especially children on episodic TV with storylines, that they have to age out actors and, you know, swap, swap characters unless they're, they're following, you know, natural progressions. That's what happens with kids. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's very naive to think that, you know, to think that TV, especially in the 90s, was not image-based and, you know, given the culture that we were all part of and to absorb, as, you know, fresh and funky as all that was, it was still reflective of the society at the time, you know? Mm -hmm. And you, you can only have one fat one because, you know, don't do it. That's stay not cool. Everybody's a type. You gotta stay in your lane. Exactly. Now, before we um before we move on from from your story, we just want to talk a little bit about the um the distancing. So you went from being golden child to finding yourself less included. What was that like? What what did that look like? What did that feel like for for everyone? Um, not just you. It felt like I used to be the cute little puppy. 
And now I'm the old dog in the corner <laughs> that nobody cares about because they're playing with <laughs> new little buttons. Because you created some iconic characters on that show and for them to not. Well, they tried to give one of them to Amanda. Yeah. Let's, that's what, that's the question I want to ask. How much do you think they went, okay, well, oh, old, uh, old little girl in, new little girl, you know, she can just take over. Well, I mean, I definitely felt that way because my iconic character was the lemonade scammer. So I had this lemonade stand and I just scam people into giving me ridiculous amounts of money. And if they don't give me what I want, I cry until I get it. Well, they wrote her in and she tried to hustle me. And I was like, get out, get out of here, kid. Like I created the game. I don't know what you're talking about. And I was like, well, this is art imitating life, isn't it? Like, who do you think you are, kid? Get out of here. I wrote the, I wrote this game. Um, but you know, she was cute. It was funny. It worked. And I was like a little offended that I was losing my space, right? I was not as prominent anymore. I didn't feel as important anymore. But I mean, no one made me feel bad. It's just what happens, right? Like she was younger and littler and it is cuter from someone younger and littler. And let's let's not beat around the bush. Very very talented, like yeah, absolutely. for a child for a child to have that kind of comic timing and understanding of comedy. It's not usual. Like yeah, like mm -hmm. these group they they put all of you guys together for a reason. You know what I mean? They they put you all together for a reason and for to find someone that is like even watching that that snippet of the stand up you know pimple in the nose story like you like that it looks like good. a season was so good. that looks like a seasoned it. professional yeah I remember it 30 years later that's how good it was mm -hmm. it was great so what was the end point for you with with that with all that <laughs> with that with all that <laughs> and Nickelodeon? um well, at this point, I am 15, almost 16, and I've graduated high school. I graduated at 15 because we had school on the set. When you have school with your own private tutors, you can go as fast as you want. So I skipped two years. I did two years worth of work in one, graduated high school three years early. So I don't have to go to school anymore. I can work longer hours. And I thought, oh, this is great. I'm going to be indispensable. Well, not really, because I was getting less and less time. And, you know, I would tell my parents, oh, I'm, you know, frustrated that I'm not being used. More. I went through all of this to be more valuable. And it was for nothing, really, because I didn't get more time. I can work more hours and I'm working less and less and less hours. And they're like, well, you know, you don't have to do this. You can just go <laughs> to college. And I was like, yeah, I think it's time. And that's what I did. And that's crazy. And and crazy. That's crazy. <laughs> Yay. And obviously not an easy decision, but one that, you know, you put you, yourself and your parents put merit and, you know, um, energy into education and giving you a life outside of the be all and end all of television, mm -hmm. which a lot of people don't get. Right. Yeah. I don't <laughs> know how many of my cast members went to college. I don't know if any of them. And you were, you were a baby at college, right? Yeah. I look like Doogie Hauser. <laughs> I, <was 15 laughs> I still looked very young. I didn't look as young as Amanda, but I looked young. I didn't look 15. I didn't look 16. I looked 12. So yeah, and... it was interesting since uh, I this was my first time getting to be a kid, which is hilarious because you're in college. Everyone, it's their first time to be an adult. But for me, oh, my God, college was a time of my life. I had no responsibilities. Like, never had I had no responsibilities. Even when I was five, 
I was taking lessons in all my spare time. It's what I wanted to do. It's what I begged to do. Singing lessons, dance lessons, every kind of lessons. And that's what I spent my whole life up until this doing. So to walk away from that and just have unlimited freedom and be able to do almost nothing, to me, almost nothing was putting in four hours a day. I was used to putting in 12 to 16. So four hours a day and I can go out with my friends. I can have lunch in a real life and I can go out, out like late and I can do whatever with no responsibility. I don't have to wake up at five for makeup. Oh my gosh. I was running amok. I was shaking my tail. I was feeling good. But so, Daisy, this, is, this is a good, this is a, well, this is a good, a good way to bring Daisy in. So Daisy, did you have any idea who Katrina was when you met her? No. Oh, this is great. <laughs> what did you think, Daisy, okay. when you first saw I, me? I've told this story a million times. Let me tell you. When Katrina walked in to our college class, I literally thought, who the hell is this chick? I'm over here in literally T-shirts, jeans, and a pair of chucks, and she is in four and a half inch heels, these white, you know, puffy pants and this really loud top with, you know, cleavage showing. I was like, she looked like a complete supermodel, right? She always looks really well done. But I was just like, girl, we are not going to the club right now. Like, <laughs> is this is college, you know? And um, I did graduate early. So I went to college at 17 and I was right around the same age as her. So I think we just kind of gravitated towards each other but when she first walked in i was kind of like oh i don't know about you you kind of seem like one of these like you know kim kardashian always done up type like i was not that person um but then she spoke and i was like oh wait she's smart so it totally i was like oh my god she's intelligent she knows what she's talking about like she's funny um other people knew who she was in the class. I did not. Um, it wasn't until after where they're like, yeah, she's Ross Perot. And I'm like, what are you guys talking about? <laughs> I'm like, what? you know, and, and they're like, yeah, from all that. And I'm like, and then somebody had showed me like a picture or something. And I was like, oh, okay. But <laughs> Um, you know, living in LA and, you know, especially where I was in Downey, they, we had a lot of people that I went to high school with that were in movies and in shows. And, you know, my other best friend was, you know, on Young and the Restless for years and years and won an Emmy and, you know, movies. And so I wasn't, was I'm a dozen basically. <laughs> I, I was no, it wasn't a dime a dozen, but I just kind of was like, Oh, okay. Like, cool. You're, you're, you were on a show. Like, that's awesome. But we just gravitated towards each other. And then we got put on a project together, which was hilarious. And then after that, I mean, it's what, 24 years later, we're still together. Don't do the math. Don't do the math. We're very young. Because you're both <laughs> 26. That's so weird, right? Yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> right it's so strange but I, well yeah you've obviously you've obviously seen the um disparity between child stars and like young actors and working actors and i i think that's obviously to katrina and her parents credit that she can actually even have the grades to go to go to um you know university and be and have a life that is outside of the, the thing that, you know, made her famous and definitely, you know, I'm sorry, famous and infamous. <laughs> do, you, do you know that she won the debate championship against a Harvard student? I would believe that. Yeah, I would definitely no. believe that. This girl <laughs> was on it. Like, it's well, so funny because people don't realize, like, they look at the blonde hair and the big boobs and they're like, oh, bimbo, right? No, she is freaking smart she's so smart it's ridiculous yeah. she's well, definitely legally blonde you know debate <laughs> was was like being on a stage i was cool with that but i stayed in my lane yeah she knows how to argue 
I've met Kat. <laughs> I've met Kat. It's so good. I know what's going on. So how you were, you said on the documentary, you were in college living your life when you someone mentioned you, hey. Yeah, it went. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about that moment. <laughs> well, I'm having the time of my life, just living it up. And um, someone says to me, hey, have you seen the Amanda Bynes show? And I was like, what? No. I'm like, oh, that makes sense because, you know, I was supposed to have one, but then she was kind of sliding into my role. So she just slid right into that, too. And <coughs> sorry, it uh, became the Amanda show. And I recognized the exact formula that I was going to do for the Katrina Johnson show. And I was like, oh. Dang, that burns a little. Of course it would. Like I was sad about that. I was yeah. very, very, very jealous. I was wishing it was me so hard. Even though I was happy as I could be, I was jealous. I was like, that was supposed to be me. That was supposed to be my role. I invested time and energy into creating new characters and writing new scenes and doing all this and that for it to go to someone else. Yeah, I was bummed. That that one, that was a bummer. Um, and I was jealous of her for years after that. Um, but, you know, looking back, I think that I was fortunate and I think that I wouldn't change anything in my life, in my path. I would I would do it all again exactly the same. Because yeah. as as much as that has to sting, and you're like, oh, look at look at we we all live through it. They made her a star. They, oh, yeah. they definitely yeah. they definitely yeah. did successful. Yeah, they definitely That's did what they what they um set out to do. Oh yeah, she was a list, and I was but that also no list. <laughs> <laughs> but that also that also seems to be where the big problems began. So do you think, and this is obviously a game of hypotheticals because we can never know. Right, I'm there, so I can't tell you, but yeah, sure. You know, game, do you go. think you, you, you got out in time? Yes. It was just a matter of time? Yeah. I mean... I had the best experience. I had everything wonderful. I loved it. Um, but then I was still also able to have a normal life, right? I got the best of both worlds. I got to be famous. I got to live the dream. I got to see if I could do it and I could do it and it was great. But then I also got a chance at having a successful something else. So yeah. I feel like I'm double blessed because I got to have it all. And, you know, I don't think very many people get that. Exactly. And this, what seems to have been the problem, the, well, the narrative of the documentary, what seems to be the problem is the longer things go unchecked and the more people get power and add foreign entities into the mix, the bigger, yes, things become, but the worse things become. Because, you know, re uh, all that was still going, at, you know, like SNL, like it, it was intended like, to be. I'm not sure exactly. I want to say 10 seasons. Yeah. Well, yeah, because I did 100th year anniversary, and then I want to say... 100 years. <laughs> 100th episode. <laughs> I was 100, 100 years old by the time it happened. <laughs> yes, exactly. Episode, and then 100 episode. I think there was also a 10 year. So it was a healthy show. and It went for a long time. What The irony of it, once Amanda was, you know, flown the coop and, and had gone to um, network television, is that they brought in another young blonde funny girl into the There's, cast of all that to, yeah. you know, <laughs> to spin off into her own show. 
And they managed to fill it with some big talent. And yeah. it seemed that that spot to fill, other than me, went on to have their own show. Because are you referring to Ms. Spears? Of course I am. How, we can't have this conversation without mentioning yes. her. Jamie Ms. Spears. <laughs> Uh, was on some later years of my show and she was cute as can be gorgeous beautiful little thing and so talented she went on to get her own show on Nickelodeon Zoe 101 yeah but then she got pregnant. correct all right yes <laughs> thank you because what I um as exhaustive as this documentary is, and we're going to talk a little bit more about what it reveals, and we're not going to talk out of school or anything like that. We're, we're t we're, I'm just talking very well-known rumours. There are some storylines that this documentary didn't pick up, let's just put it that way, to do with some of the people that came after you that filled the original spot. Mm -hmm. I feel like we definitely, once the narrative, uh, Amanda's narrative kind of ended once, you know, she was no longer working with Dan, which I think that there is still a lot to say about Amanda's narrative. If you look at the girl she was to the woman she is now. Yes. It's quite terrifying, actually. And there is obviously reasons why Zoe 101 ended when it did and all that kind of stuff. As I said, if you want to know about it, you can find out. All you have to do is Google. We're not saying any of it's true, any of it's not true, but it's interesting that we stopped that narrative. Well, here's why. There. It's a documentary. <laughs> it's based in fact. They right. can't just go regurgitate a bunch of rumours. And, Unless somebody steps forward. Yeah. <laughs> and that's it. They just only showed what had been either proven legally or someone was willing to testify right then and there. So they can't talk about everything because they need someone who is then and there to bring it to light. Especially if this is really popular and then someone's willing to break an NDA. Right. <laughs> We've got a sequel. <laughs> well, those, those NDAs are pretty scary to break. I didn't even come they on are. this show, my own show, to talk about this because of the <laughs> ironclad NDAs. Also, they were real yeah. careful not to tell me anything about it. So, Yeah, which is the whole point we're having this conversation. So things are getting a bit dark, folks. So if you are um, sensitive towards some of the darkest stuff that you that went through this um child abuse the worst kind of yeah. child abuse now would be the time yeah. to... to tune out <laughs> so i think the big grab part of this documentary is that someone was stepping forward someone 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 and even in the trailer it is a mystery like big someone mystery. who has never stepped forward before a new tale, and, nothing you can find on YouTube, brand new information, a bombshell. I was legitimately surprised when I found out who it was. Well because it wasn't it was like if like if you don't believe rumor mills and all that kind of stuff, you know, if you do you know, you do the research and stuff, it's all out there somewhere. Yes. Someone's yes. heard someone say something. <laughs> But that's not. Factual. I know someone who knew who it was right. way before I did, and she told me, and she's right. <laughs> there, she's right there. So, Daisy, <laughs> tell me what you said when you called me, and you're like, "Hey, well, okay." So she tells me, "Hey, I just filmed this thing for HBO. It's a documentary on Nickelodeon," and I was like, "Is it?" about Dan Schneider and she's like, well, no. She's like, they asked me about him, but it's not about him. And I'm like, are you sure? I'm like, because I've been seeing a lot of grumblings online and different, you know, social media. And I was just like, I think they're doing something against him. And she's like, I really hope not. 
And I asked her flat out, I've been friends with her for 24 years. I was like, well, did he ever touch you? And she's like, no, she's like, absolutely not. She's like, never. She's like, he was always super nice with me. We worked uh, really well together. We wrote a lot of stuff together, developed characters. So it was completely professional. So then I'm like, okay, well, what exactly is it about? I'm like, cause the other thing that I was kind of reading around was that Drake Bell was going to come out and say that he was abused. And I was actually reading about uh, Brian Peck and then Brian Singer, um, who is also another pedophile that was uh, around the same time, got caught and yeah. was also sent to jail. And, you know, they were things going around and she's like, I don't think it's Drake Bell. And I'm like, I think it really is. I said, are you sure that it's not anything to do with that? And she's like, I don't think so. I hope not. And here we are today. <laughs> it was about exactly that. Daisy was right. And here I am, an idiot that was in it, and I had no idea. But I think it's important that we, that, and everyone notes that, A, it is the star of one of their shows. Like, it wasn't an extra. It wasn't. Not to say that that all that stuff didn't happen is documented in the documentary. There were other things going on, yes. But, but this star. big lead thing, he was the star of not one, but two of the shows. And for a lot of, I'm a bit old to, to have been there and you know, but <laughs> I think most of us are. But he was a he was a bona fide star. He was doing music, he was doing all that kind of stuff. And he'd been in Jerry Maguire. Yeah, and he'd worked in Hollywood movies, you know, TV shows, all that kind of stuff. This wasn't a nobody. No. And for no, for it to happen to a star. Friend. Yeah. He was targeted. The star of a network. Mm hmm That's well, it can happen to anybody. Stuff. Yeah, that's exactly and it, Daisy. It can happen to anybody and um, you know, Katrina and I went to college. She, uh, my degree's in psychology and hers is in rhetoric. So you can see where we're at. But um, it, it's good to bring to light that this can happen to anybody. It can happen to the best families. Um, it can happen to anyone at any time. It's something that you always have to be vigilant, especially as a parent, to be there. And I can tell you 100% that Katrina's situation where she was able to leave unscathed is completely to the credit of her parents. Her parents totally. were there every step of the way, you know, even her mother who, you know, when I had barely just met her, you know, um, being um, a PA and she was like, oh, you need to do this and giving me medical, you know, advice. And I was just kind of like, okay, like I barely just met you, but thank you. Like it was very nice. And, but it was always that caring nature of her parents that, really allowed her to blossom and kind of come out of the Hollywood unscathed. Um, but again, it has to do a lot with the parents, like intuition and knowing if something doesn't feel right, it's for a reason. Although uh, it is mentioned <clears throat> that Drake's dad had that intuition. And, and you can tell... You can Barry. tell that that yeah that weighs very very heavily on that man to this day that he that that monster I think it's the only way to put it was allowed by everyone on that set to mm -hmm. get to work their way into his family and basically take his place to the fact that he was having that poor boy stay at his house and not having any way of escaping or, you know, that's terrifying. It's, I'm not a parent, but that is terrifying. It's beyond terrifying. And, you know, it's amazing to me that Drake was able to get through all of that and still, still star on his own TV show, still make music, and the show must go on. And I, for the life of me, I cannot imagine how incredibly difficult and impossible that must have felt. Mm -hmm. I can't, I can't imagine because I had all the love and support in the world. And let me tell you, it was still very difficult. I was exhausted. And I don't know 
how he managed to have this inner struggle and still be the shining star that he was. And I'm just so impressed. And our love and support goes to him entirely because he's amazing. He didn't deserve any of that. It's, yeah, it is just an amazing, and I think a lot, and a lot of the castmates mention it too. I think it's a testament to therapy that people can unpack this stuff and still be able to, you know, move on and not like, obviously the, the tried and true track for child stars is drug addiction, alcohol addiction, da, 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 da. Like that's, that's how it is. And a lot of people go through that, but everyone that spoke on the documentary is like, I'm trying to deal with my stuff so that another generation of people don't have to. And for Drake to actually step forward, and I know that he was kind of not really forced, but given that option by his his friends, his girlfriend's mother of all people, which is like that. Yeah, yeah, that was yeah, that was chilling when when he was like got to that point where it's like you know he's at the girlfriend's house and this guy is ringing nonstop, 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 nonstop. And that's that's a great parent. <laughs> like to just go, because hmm? she said it took like two seconds for him for her to figure out something was wrong. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. But I can't imagine the um, the courage it took to to come forward. Especially you know they were in development for his show. It wasn't a, like it Jake wasn't and Josh wasn't. Deal. So everything yeah. could have been compromised if he came forward. If he dropped a bomb if he had bad publicity if he was seen in the wrong light if he was too much trouble for the network i mean I, there are so many things that could have gone wrong and you know when you are the star of the show it's not just your career you're putting in jeopardy it's 400 other people that work on the show you're this whole entity so to have all that pressure and be able to make it happen is a testament to who he is, and it's amazing. But can I just now, say that yeah. as a child, it's never the child's fault, period. No, of course It not. is never. never the child's fault. And the fact that I will say to the credit of, of Dan Schneider, um, you know, the way that he talks about him and him being the only one that actually – call him and see how he was doing. And Dan uh, came out today and did an interview saying that he actually helped Drake's mom write her statement for court that she read aloud. So that's really amazing. And the fact that he, he, you know, he didn't write a character letter for this guy, you know, he stood by Drake and he knew at that point that no matter what the situation was, the child is never to blame. A hundred percent. Period. Yes. Yeah. Um, and I want to also talk about all of the people in support of the child molester. So his attacker pled no contest, which means guilty, and yeah. was supported by seemingly all of Hollywood. So crazy names, and that Daisy's done her due diligence here. Yes. Do you want to do you want to talk us through some of these names, Daisy? Because oh, watching it, I was in shock. Like I was like, oh, "What? What? What?" So there's 41 character letters that have been unsealed. I mean, obviously, the documentary talks about the biggest ones, right? So like James Marston, and then uh, Will Friedle and Ryder Strong from Boy Meets World, um, but. I read each and every letter, um, you know, because Katrina had even said, well, like, is this something that it was like a copy paste and he just sent it to everybody and they just signed it not knowing. But no, these were actual letters like James, James Marston talks about like how he was a, a, a pillar of, of moral ethics and that he, you know, even yelled at him one day for parking in a handicapped spot for something that he was just going to run in and get. And, you know, he made him move his car and, you know, he's a great person and, you know, he's suffered so much and all this other stuff. And it's incredible to me because I'm like, obviously, oh, and additional to that, 
they've all come out saying that he's admitted to them that what he did and that he was guilty of it and he was going to take his punishment. However, he, Brian Peck, also described it that he was a victim of jailbait, meaning that it wasn't his fault. It was Drake's fault because, you know, he had tempted him. No, you are an adult and he is a child. Oh, period. Yeah. There, there is no, there no, is no, I don't care if he here. comes out in his mm-hmm. underwear. You are not to touch a child, period. You are an adult. You know better. Yes. Um, or you should know better. There's uh, nothing that a child could do to be the blame of this or to cause it or to tempt any adult. It's the adult's job to protect the child. And in particular, this adult was tasked with basically guardianship every time Drake needed to go to an audition or anything in Hollywood or have coaching. He would go pick him up in Orange County, drive him all the way to L.A., drive him to whatever the event was, and then keep him there as a hostage. So it was just incredibly wrong. And for the life of me, I can't imagine how some of Hollywood's biggest stars came out in support. And some of those some of those stars were obviously young people that had worked with him in their youth and da da da. The one name that really threw me was Alan Thick. Because he yeah. was an he was a grown ass man. He oh. was, you know, America's dad. Yeah. <laughs> and he is standing up for this guy. He wrote that on his letter. He said, I'm known as America's favorite TV dad, an identity that I proudly carry throughout the country. He talks about, you know, oh, he, he, if he didn't think that Brian was safe, he wouldn't have had his own two young sons around him. And, you know, this is crazy to me, but I'm, you know, also let's think about Alan Thicke's son and how he's been acting and the trouble that he's gotten in. So, I mean, I don't know. This letter doesn't hold much value to me. Well, also, they do go on the show to say that. Um, an older lady from Growing Pains mm-hmm. um, conversed with the show, now this show, this documentary, saying that if she had known what Brian Peck had actually done, she would have never have written that letter. She was misled completely. She does not stand behind him and she wishes she could take it back, but, you know, she can't now. So this I is think- the same thing that happened with the Danny Masterson trial with Mila Kunis and oh, Ashton yeah. Kutcher. And you Ashton know, mm-hmm. the, these yeah. legal representatives yeah. come forward and go, hey, can you do a character? What do you know about this person? They don't necessarily present the facts yeah, of the case. Yeah, they're not going to say this person is a rapist. No. Please stand in support of this person because allegedly what Josh Peck said that he did was to be led into temptation by this young man and he didn't go into detail. He said he was led into temptation and he did it. Brian and he Peck. Was, sorry. But he didn't <laughs> say what exactly he did. He didn't yeah. detail it. He didn't actually admit it. I think he completely misled the people that wrote the letters. Yeah. And yeah, I just felt sick to my stomach watching it definitely it was definitely disturbing um and but, obviously uh, hold that, on. That, think, those characters yeah i wanted to ask daisy um <laughs> who watched a podcast um, um yes was it called boy meets podcast yes. yeah it's the boy meets world podcast um So it's interesting because, you know, looking back before this documentary aired, they came out and started talking about Brian Peck and it's very suspect, right? Like, why are you talking about this guy? Why now? Way back when. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. exactly. Because it was a couple of weeks before the pot, before this show aired that they started talking about it. Mm -hmm. Correct. So yeah, obviously they got word, Hey, they got a hold of these letters. It's they've been unsealed. They tried to get ahead of the, the the story right they're gonna spin it their way so they don't look bad you know but 
And wait, what did they actually say on their podcast? That, you know, they knew this guy, but they didn't really know what had happened and that Brian Peck, you know, labeled it to them that he was a victim of, you know, jailbait and that, you know, oh, you know, I just got uh, caught up in the moment and, you know, I'm going to take my punishment and yeah, I did it. But, you know, uh, he, 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 he was the one that, that basically started it and tempted me and, you know, kind of just, you know, putting it back on the victim and which was not true, obviously, because if you've read the court documents, um, it's not true, uh, anything that he's saying, but this is what allegedly, you know, Brian told these guys. Um, I find it interesting, though, that they would choose to talk about it now, obviously, mm -hmm. you know, getting ahead of the story. But secondly, you know, Will Friedle talks about like, you know, I remember being in the courtroom and, you know, just a scene, you know, this kid on the other side with his mom and, you know, wondering to myself, like, what am I doing here? Um, but Drake Bell addressed that. I don't know if you guys saw his Twitter where he's like, you know, you guys were like 22 and 24. Yeah. And, and then after that, you know, the he, audacity, the audacity, they end up working on a show together years later and, and he doesn't apologize. He doesn't address it. Like, can you imagine someone that was on the side of your abuser where you have to work with them now and they haven't even said you know what i am so sorry i screwed up big time i don't i i didn't know the whole story or anything i mean he talks about he's in the courtroom and that's how he felt well why didn't he feel that way when he was working with him years ago why didn't he address it then Mm -hmm. Oh, you feel bad about it now, right? Especially when you get to you get to know that person and see what that has done to that person. Like he, Drake, like Drake talks about his issues that you know have stemmed from this, and then working with that person and seeing what their life has become because of this event that you basically supported. I I don't know how you get around that. Yeah, as a although person. I'm like. I think his life has become something great. I think he's done. Yeah, now. Yeah, definitely. Um, but he deserves better. Come on, I, let's think, it together. I think that that's why he's talking about it now. I, I think that that's kind of like his last step towards healing, right? Is to come out with so. it. Just tell his truth. And like. He deserves that. Absolutely. You see it in his face and in his eyes. Like, like he's just ready to let this to deal with it and just, and, yeah. and just you know yeah. and it's sad um and it it must have been very very hard for him to have to deal with this quietly for so many years and i'm actually surprised that he hasn't turned out worse absolutely right 100 percent, 100 percent. because you know this can turn really really dark really you know really quickly and the fact that he was able to survive and you know He's, he has had his troubles, as you would expect. As you would expect, like, someone who has been through that and not dealt with it, because, as he said in the show, therapy wasn't an option back in the time. Like, like, he was just like, yep, yeah, okay, go to work. today. Keep working and then deal with it when you're an adult. Like, deal with that when you're an adult. Unpack it later. But this is exactly why I reached Shaka to, 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 to Katrina and said, what do you want to say? Because I think voices matter on every side, and Drake has stepped forward and given his opinion, his like his experience. Katrina stepped forward and given her experience. The reality exists in between that and around that. It's not black and white. It's like yes, this person is good, this person is bad. It's as we said when the, when things grow and more energy gets put into it, and different people things twist and change and you can never know until down the track what really happens behind the scenes. So I think that it's a great conversation to have. It'll be very interesting to see how this resonates, I think. Mm -hmm. well, because there are other there are other voices that haven't been heard for sure. I'm sure. And for everyone that stepped forward, that, that yeah, <laughs> yeah. I hope this has been a very healing experience for everyone involved. 
I don't feel like I needed that much healing. I feel yeah. like a lot of other people definitely did and do. And I hope that this was a chance to just let everything out and let it go. And I hope that we can all just love and support each other here forward and that everyone feels healed or at least on the road to recovery from whatever it is that they experienced. And kind of liken it to the Joss Whedon situation where there is this this show or this entity that has brought millions of people, millions and millions of people, joy and, you know, aspirations and laughter worldwide. It doesn't have to be tainted by this. Yeah, it happens. This happens to the people. It doesn't set, It doesn't have to infect everything. Like J.K. Rowling, claim claim these things that you love and do something better with them. Is is my hope for them? And you know, for Nickelodeon, for everyone that was that has suffered at the hands of what went on, is that this will lead to something better, like new laws, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Something good has to come of it when you speak up. So, Daisy, what do you want to? What do you want people to take away from this? Do you think this whole situation? So, therapy, therapy yeah. is such a wonderful thing, and a lot of people think, "Well, I'm not crazy," you know. And now, I would say that mental health is kind of more at the forefront, and more people understand that it's not for crazy people. It's literally a way to help you unpack your thoughts in a healthy and methodical way and, and give you other perspectives and other tools that you may need to use. And so I'm a huge advocate for mental health. Um, go to therapy, go to group sessions if you want, if you're uncomfortable with it. Um, you know, if you're not comfortable with a, a clinical therapist, go talk to your spiritual leader, you know, whoever it is, Seek out someone outside of your family and outside of your friends that can give you a non-biased ear, someone that you can just divulge everything to. And if it's too big for them to handle, they can reach out if you're uncomfortable about it. Um, I would say the biggest thing that I would hope is that um, Drake Bell gets apologies all around from those 41 letter writers um, because he deserves it. And I hope that he can move past it and heal. And um, I really think that there should be clinical therapists on every TV set to be able to watch out for certain things, to be able to pinpoint someone that's depressed or someone that's going through something and be able to call them out and say, okay, is this something you want to do? Or are, are you done with this? Is this your parents? Or is this for you? Yeah. And we've definitely talked about it on UCR Live. Oh, and we've definitely, oh, hello, me. And we've definitely talked about it on UCR Live before when Katrina's been on the panel. I feel like child-centric based television shows need to have an extra part of education to help these kids understand finances. They should have a ther like they should have a therapist on set. They should set them up. Yes, this is the now. This is amazing. You're amazing. You're doing amazing things. But what happens when the amazing wears off? Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think we're doing enough for kids in this state because it's not as simple as there are never any kids in anything ever again. That's not the way of the world. That's not the way the world works. We can only hope for better. And I think that, you know, after these four hours of quite bleak, bleak things, um, yeah, hope was. is, I think, what comes through at the end, the hope for a better tomorrow, hope for, you know, growth and change. And as I said to these ladies, oh, this won't be a long conversation. It'll be fine. And we've just gone over the hour mark. But I would really like to thank both Daisy and Katrina for being here today. I think it's been great to get, like, a more rounded picture of the story of, you know, and this is literally the tip of the iceberg with all of this so if you want to go and do a bit more research watch the documentary do your own research make your own. we're not trying to sway you either way you can, we are just as we said telling katrina's story and and what we know about you know the facts so if you want to learn more empower yourselves every story matters every voice matters if you are struggling the most important thing to know is there is always someone who will listen so make sure you speak up, speak out, 
Thank you, ladies, for coming on today. Thank you for everyone for joining us. We purposely haven't put comments up today because of the subject matter. So we can see that you are, are watching. Thank you so much. Katrina is going to go back and read through some of these because there's some lovely comments there for you, Kat. So um, thanks for joining us. And we hopefully will see these two again on a, maybe a bit, a bit of a lighter show maybe next time. But I think it's... I think it's important. Thank you for watching us with us today, guys. We'll see you again soon on Uncensored Radio. Bye.